I'm Neil Patterson. Welcome back to the Sky News Daily on what has been a very big day at the COVID inquiry. But uh, just to be contrary, we're going to begin back in 2021 at a Scottish Government COVID briefing. Then First Minister Nicola Sturgeon was asked if she would hand over WhatsApps to any future inquiry. She promised that she would. But she didn't. In fact, she couldn't ever have fulfilled that promise, as when she made it, she'd already deleted many of her messages. So today at the inquiry, Ms Sturgeon had this to say. The importance, uh, in my view, is making sure that the inquiry has at its disposal all of the evidence underpinning uh, the decisions as well as the decisions we were arriving at. I operated uh, from... You know, 2007, uh, based on advice, uh, the policy that uh, messages, business relating to government should not be kept on a phone that could be lost or stolen and insecure in that way, but properly recorded uh, through the system. I, I would want to, again, uh, underline that in, in my case, uh, that communication uh, was extremely limited, and I do not... Uh, I you know, would not relate uh, to matters of substantive government decision-making. So why does this matter when we clearly already know what Nicola Sturgeon's government did to combat COVID during the pandemic? Well, to learn lessons, we need to know how decisions were arrived at and, indeed, why other options were discarded. And let's be honest... It does feel like there is now a pattern of behaviour across the country with politicians routinely using WhatsApp and then deleting away merrily. That's something we will focus on just a little later with our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. But let's begin with the inquiry itself. Conor Gillis is our Scotland correspondent and he joins us from outside the, the inquiry hearing taking place, of course, uh, today in Edinburgh. Good to see you, Conor. Um, this was always going to be a difficult day for Nicola Sturgeon, wasn't it? It was. There's a lot riding on this moment from Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, some of the COVID bereaved and the lawyer representing them said this is essentially Nicola Sturgeon on trial. On trial for the decisions that she made during the height of the COVID pandemic here in Scotland. And the importance of those exchanges, Connor, is in in working out exactly how decisions were made by the Scottish Government, how those decisions were arrived at the information that was taken, which is why I suspect many, many people north and south of the Scottish border are a little bit perplexed as to why Nicola Sturgeon said all the way back in 2021, I will hand over my WhatsApp messages when, and correct me if I'm wrong here, she already knew she'd deleted them. I think that's why there was a sense of nervousness when she first appeared here at 10 o'clock this morning. She knew that her reputation was on the line here, the stakes were high, and a lot of it goes back to, well, why is the missing WhatsApp messages and why are they important? Because we don't know what was in them because they no longer exist. But why it matters is because Nicola Sturgeon herself gave a cast iron guarantee uh, during a live television COVID briefing back in 2021 to a journalist when asked whether she would hand over all of those exchanges, including those on WhatsApp, she gave an assurance that she absolutely would. Uh, And that clearly didn't turn out to be the case. And it came out in evidence today that when she gave that assurance, the messages had already been wiped. Yeah, I mean, she may have apologised, but she's had a few years in which to correct the record. Because, because of course, this stuff, as we've learned through WhatsApps that were not deleted, is accessible under the Freedom of Information Act. Indeed, there was a government email that went out in August 2021 telling people to retain all relevant materials. But at the same time, from the evidence today, we've been hearing that there were civil servants who were actively encouraging deletion at and around that time. Yeah, Nicola Sturgeon said in the evidence that she wasn't aware of a do not destroy notice and that we shouldn't place too much significance on the deletion of her WhatsApps because she didn't routinely conduct government business. We won't know that because those messages uh, don't exist. But there seems to be a patchwork of who was applying this policy to delete and who wasn't. The former chief of staff to Nicola Sturgeon, a woman called Liz Lloyd, gave evidence here at the inquiry in Edinburgh last week uh, where she said that she held on to some of those messages and some of those messages were playing out 
here at the inquiry and in public, like that reference to Nicola Sturgeon calling uh, the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson a clown. Another couple of cabinet secretaries in Nicola Sturgeon's uh, government at the time kept their messages as well. So there was a mishmash of the policy being applied and that is why there's no coherent argument to why some did and some didn't retain them. Understandably, counsel for the inquiry had focused to some extent on, on this point. In particular, of course, it was a WhatsApp group that admittedly Nicola Sturgeon was not a part of, but messages were shown where civil servants were discussing the deletion policy. Uh, Ken Thompson, one former civil servant, said that his middle names were plausible deniability. I mean, it doesn't look good, does it? It's not a great look. It's embarrassing and especially for the COVID bereaved who've been standing outside here in the rain determined to get answers here when civil servants are acting in that way when politicians are acting in that way it doesn't instill the confidence that they really hope existed during the crisis Nicola Sturgeon's point has been that she didn't routinely conduct government business um, I suppose it begs the question, is the word routinely there doing heavy lifting? Because this inquiry has heard evidence here today that there were exchanges between Nicola Sturgeon and our Chief of Staff, Liz Lloyd, about changes to the number of people who could attend weddings and funerals. There were exchanges led in evidence here about the numbers of people allowed to attend hospitality venues. Should that be six people from different households? A back and forth, uh, sort of thrashing out the possibilities between that powerful duo in Scotland. And what's even more telling here is that despite Liz Lloyd hanging on to some of the messages, none exist whatsoever from the start of the first lockdown to the very end of August in that year. There are big questions as to why some exist, but that crucial part of the decision-making during the lockdown period don't exist. Amar Anwar, the lawyer for the bereaved, has suggested there were big things on during that time. The Alex Salmon trial, were there discussions around Operation Brantsform, clearly that investigation looking at the SNP's funding and finances. Were there exchanges during that particular period in time that the former First Minister didn't want to get out? Well, we'll never know because they don't exist. Going back to COVID, though, this is the one bit that I have to admit I've racked my brains about and I simply cannot understand it. Explain to me, Connor, what the Scottish Government's position is when it comes to those gold command meetings, the meetings that took place between Nicola Sturgeon and the handful of advisers, her very closest advisers. You know, you would expect this, this key group of individuals who were clearly involved significantly in the decision-making process, you'd expect there to be full, complete minutes of those meetings. There's not one single sentence written about what went on in those Gold Command meetings. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. There's no minutes whatsoever. So every Tuesday, the Scottish Cabinet met to decide the course of action over the following days. But what has emerged over this inquiry is that there were separate smaller gatherings led by the former First Minister. There were dubbed Gold Command meetings. Uh, there's no records of it whatsoever. And again, that feeds into this discussion about openness and transparency and that potential for there to be conspiracy of cover-up, which clearly she denies. We know that she is an incredibly gifted politician. She is a very able orator. She is a lawyer. She's able to handle complex arguments. There was also a touch of the emotion, more than a touch, of emotion from the former First Minister today, wasn't there? I think in those initial moments when she was being sworn in and the first couple of minutes of her testimony, there was a sense of nervousness, that breathlessness that we've maybe witnessed a couple of times, glimpses of in the aftermath of her arrest and release as part of Operation Branch Form, looking into the SNP's funding and finances. A slight hint at that nervous look that she was giving there, but that quickly changed into her usual emboldened way, giving answers in a very direct fashion with confidence. And then came that moment where it was put to her that clearly it was no big surprise that she didn't think Boris Johnson was up to the job of being prime minister and stewarding the country through the COVID pandemic from Westminster. And it was put to her by the council here that, well, was she up to the job of being Scotland's first minister here when she was uh, being critical of Boris Johnson? And at that moment, she broke down. There were tears and she said, actually, sometimes she wishes 
that she was not in that position. I think it shows a sense of vulnerability, but it also shows the weight that is on her shoulders here, that her reputation is on the line and the pressure is really on. I was the First Minister when uh, the pandemic struck. There's a large part of me wishes that I hadn't been, um, but I was, and I wanted to be the best First Minister I could be during that period, is for others to judge the extent to which I succeeded. Uh, and I think, you know, you've seen snippets of perhaps, you know, the, the sort of human side of, of being a leader and a politician in these moments. At times in those early days, I, I felt overwhelmed by the scale of what we were uh, dealing with. And perhaps more than anything, I felt an overwhelming responsibility. Uh, to, to do the best I could. And that's, so the idea that in those horrendous days, weeks, I was thinking of a political opportunity, I find, well, it's just, it wasn't true. Yeah, she is also a professional politician with decades of experience in how to handle the media and indeed the public on occasions like this. I mean, Connor, forgive me for being cynical. Let me just try and break this down so it makes absolutely certain that we've got all of this. You have Nicola Sturgeon saying she's committed to openness and transparency, yet there are no minutes of the Gold Command meetings. Civil servants, ministers were told via email to retain all relevant material. You had Kate Forbes and Hamza Yusuf doing so. But you also have people like Ken Plausible Deniability Thompson encouraging deletion. And to top it all off, she gives this incredibly emotional apology for saying in 2021 that she would release her WhatsApps. But she said that knowing they were already deleted. And she's had the best part of three years to correct the record. So, so why didn't she? Here's the question, Connor. She has given her personal assurance the inquiry has all it needs. How can anyone believe her? Well, the COVID bereaved certainly don't believe her. They think that this was a cynical, premeditated decision to uh, knowingly delete those WhatsApps. And they're now plotting what to do next. They are suggesting that this may not be the end of the road. They are potentially suggesting that they could contact police and this could become a criminal matter. Now, Nicola Sturgeon does not have her troubles to seek. This is a former First Minister who has been at the centre of a police investigation examining what went on in the SNP's funding and finances. She was arrested and later released. Her husband was in the same uh, position. That investigation still is ongoing as it stands. And it is a tricky position for her to be in as this... COVID uh, inquiry continues. Thank you, Connor, joining us from a very wet and noisy Edinburgh. Don't go away. In just a moment, Sam Coates will be here to explain the growing use of WhatsApp in politics. Once upon a time, if politicians wanted to communicate on sensitive matters, they'd have to find a quiet corner of the parliamentary estate, often one of its many bars, and speak in hushed tones. The advent of social media and the rise of the WhatsApp group made it far easier to have these secret squirrel conversations, but amusingly, it made it also far more dangerous. Uh, well, let's speak to someone who has never deleted a WhatsApp message, I'm sure. Uh, our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, is, is currently rolling his eyes in, in Westminster. When did politicians discover the, the joys of using WhatsApp. It does seem to me to be a fairly recent invention. That was the group of Brexiteers, hardline Brexiteers from the European Research Group, our old friends on the Tory right, the ERG, and they organised themselves in a WhatsApp group in a way that, that at that point, when they did it, had never happened. That, at one point, it had 70, 80 members, and it was just the most phenomenally powerful thing in, 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 in British politics. And this group basically held Theresa May's government hostage because all of a sudden you had 40, 50, 60, 70, which critically was more than the majority that Theresa May had inherited from David Cameron. And at a stroke, you know, if all this group acted as one, and they did, then the organisers of the group, like Steve Baker, now of course the government minister, could just say, go out on the airways, complain about this, tweet about this, take to the radio, take to the telly, accept media, but, or if they wanted to really demonstrate their power and number 10 was nervous, number 10 might come to them and go, we're really terrified about you kicking off. And the ERG would go, well, we won't in exchange for this concession or that concession, at which point the message would go out on the ERG WhatsApp group, 
to be silent, to not rebel, to not cause problems. And it was the first example I ever saw of an organising principle being transformed by a technological platform. And it was a really, really important development. Yeah, hugely important, hugely important. But then, of course, it, it, it almost seemed to be used just by the, the, the rank and file backbenchers. As a, as a place for, for airing their grievances with some pretty predictable results. So what happened post-2017, and, and, and this has sort of sludged its way into our politics today, is that WhatsApp groups became just commonplace in all sorts of different bits of British politics. So, you know, there's a WhatsApp group for what colour pyjamas you wear in the morning. There's probably a WhatsApp group if you don't wear pyjamas in the morning. Everything in your <laughs> in life it, yeah. has a... <sighs> has a, just focus, just has a WhatsApp group. So whether it's Conservative Party MPs, Labour Party MPs, Labour Party MPs who, you know, like Jeremy Corbyn, don't like Jeremy Corbyn, like Brexit, don't, right. In a bigger WhatsApp group, it became more and more possible that exchanges would be screenshot and then leaked. And in a big WhatsApp group, if somebody said something toxic, silly, funny, rude, contentious, then actually, over time, we realised that there probably was quite a big chance of something of something leaking. So it's not just screenshots, Neil. This is the this is the point. Your if you put your entire life, all your private thoughts, all your secret desires, all your temporary dislikes, all your, you know, exploding kind of moments of fury into your WhatsApp and it stays there, it stays there on both your phone and the person you sent it to or the group that you send it to and anybody who's got your six digit pin could get access to it. It's incredibly unsafe and it's incredibly stupid. So that's the first thing that happened. People learned that everything could leak. And then there are these inquiries, which I suspect is why you're asking me all these questions today. Inquiries basically found that they could compel people to hand over their WhatsApps, WhatsApps that I think pretty much people thought were likely to be private. Why on earth would they think that they were private? Why on earth would they think if it was, say, for example, a phone that was handed back into Labour HQ it's a party phone, it doesn't belong to you. Ministers, you know, they're, they're in WhatsApp groups on, on those phones. I mean, why would, they, why would they ever think that the stuff, which and we, we've mentioned this on the podcast already, you can apply under the Freedom of Information Act to gain access to these communications. Why, why would they think that, they, that no one would ever see them? I mean, it just strikes me as daft. So it's, it's really interesting that, that you ask that with like, such certainty. I'm not sure, like, OK, full disclosure, this... <laughs> it's a Sky phone. It's got my telephone number attached. It's got my WhatsApps attached. Do I think Sky have the right to go through all my WhatsApps? Well, actually, let's just not go down that mental thought route. But I, I'm not sure that they do. If some WhatsApps were personal, they weren't part of the government record, if they were not related to public service, if they were kind of expressing opinions about people or kind of half formed thoughts or the kind of thing that you would say in a conversation, which is never recorded, you know, conversations in corridors in Westminster are never recorded, but, you know, half thoughts on WhatsApp meant very casually, should should they form part of the public record um, it, you, you know, it's, it, it's a lot less clear to me. It seems like a lot, a lot grayer area. But the, the precedent that feels like it's being set is that if it's on WhatsApp, it comes out. And that, that is the thing that's caused difficulty for Boris Johnson, difficulty and a half for Dominic Cummings. Uh, and at the moment, it's causing difficulty for Nicola Sturgeon because she hasn't got any to hand over. Have, have we found ourselves in a, in a rather fascinating position where some of the most senior politicians in the land, Prime Minister, First Minister, uh, so on, you know, almost have a kind of a, a Rebecca Vardy approach to data security. You know, phones have been dropped into seas, messages have just disappeared. I mean, shouldn't we expect more of our politicians, particularly in times of national crisis, when they all knew, or they should have assumed, there's a public inquiry coming and all this stuff is going to be dragged into the spotlight? Let me just put the... the it's not quite the counterpoint to that, but the sort of complicated situation that we've now got, got ourselves into, right... You know, politics is dynamic. People change their behaviour on the basis of, of, of what they see and read and, you know, what's reported. And, and people see these inquiries coming along. So what has everybody done? They've turned on disappearing messages. So I still get the same absolutely ridiculous messages from people in government, but they just automatically expire after seven days or 30 days or one day or whatever. Now, my question to, to you, Neil, is, is that any better? I mean, just because it's formalised, because it, like... 
And, and a lot of email policies are not that dissimilar. I think actually all of this is a gray area. What makes it okay if it's automatically deleted? Nothing, absolutely nothing. I mean, I suppose that the, the answer that I would give is, yeah, I kind of expect our politicians to be performing in a different fashion to, for example, private, you know, or, or publicly traded media companies when it comes to retention of important information. But we, we find ourselves now in a situation with politicians having switched on this disappearing message function, that this stuff is lost to the ether. Isn't the solution to this that if government officials or ministers or politicians are using WhatsApp, that they switch that off? That if this is going to be a, me a means by which people in government communicate on topics of significance, that they're not allowed to do that. I don't know the answer, but I know the problem with your with, with where you're coming from, which is you are asking us all to delineate in clear and clean lines like how we live our lives, right? Sometimes I message you, Neil Patterson, about work, about the time I'm going to walk into the studio, whether I need to wear a tie, whether I need to behave myself. Maybe if, you know, that would be needed for the record okay sometimes I message you about my private life and we don't go into details about that but I would not expect that to go into the public record um, and sometimes it's a bit of a grey area where maybe I'm just having a bit of a whinge now transfer that example to government right if you're doing the first thing isn't that different to the second thing and isn't that different to the third thing you know m you know m maybe we require like politicians just have like a different phone for government business where they know everything's ha happening. But the odd bit of communication will be on the other phone. I, I don't have a solution, but I, I, I find it hard to think that the genie can go back in the bottle in quite such a straightforward way. So here's the final question to you, Sam. As a result of, you know, these WhatsApp groups being leaked, as a result of there being a real focus at the COVID inquiry and, and in other inquiries, of course, about about the use of WhatsApp and, uh, and the revelations that there have been, do you think in future there will be more or less transparency about the manner in which politicians arrive at decisions? Can we just acknowledge the counterfactual, right? 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 30 years ago, there would be zero transparency about conversations in corridors, right? Now, we have a few extra things due to technological advance that, that may or may not continue to be available to us. Although we also have to acknowledge that one message from one person which makes it to the public domain often can create a completely misleading impression because it doesn't come with the context of the person sending it and the person receiving it. So it actually can be a completely false flag as well. Context is everything. So your question was about proper transparency. I think it's always been limited. And I think that technological advance and then behavioural change as a result of what we've seen means it will just continue to take other forms. There hasn't been total transparency ever and nor will there ever be. But there will always be a tension between the retention of huge and increasingly huge amount of data about every individual's lives, what they're prepared to see in the public domain, what we think of as the line between public and private um, and just the fact that some of this stuff is just dangerous when it gets out because people totally misinterpret it. Thank you very much, Sam. And that is your lot for today. We'll see you next time. Within a couple of seconds, there were a number of armed security with great big airport machine guns. And autism patients daring escape from NHS psychiatric care pits her against some of the most powerful institutions in the state. From the multi-award-winning Sky News Storycast team, in partnership with The Independent, follow Patient 11 wherever you get your podcasts.